was considering some of the questions that have been that we're going to be considering this evening and some of the other ones are also on the topic list and how they they have a simple answer. Yes. Do you know these things? Yes. Do you know these things? No. What did you do? This. It's a very simple answer, but there are implications yeah. and deeper things that need to be seen than just a surface answer when you're considering these things. The reason it is asked is for consideration and it's for searching and it's for knowing more fully the implications and the outcomes of the things that are being asked, as we've already heard a little this evening as well. The reason it is, there is a reason it's called examination. So with that in consideration, I'll, Brother Michael's text is Romans 6, 16. It says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And I was considering how there are two masters who are obeyed, and, and the fruit of obeying them is seen in the life of the servant. And it has been said before, but it's always good to say again, that there are only two masters, either God or Satan. And you can serve God, which will show forth the fruit of righteousness in you, the servant, and you can serve Satan, which will show forth the fruit of death in you as well. So whichever you serve will have the fruit showing forth in, your, in you. And there are many ways in which these fruits manifest. Righteousness manifests itself in right living, in godliness, in um, goodness, in light, in the fruit of the Spirit, and many other ways. And then death manifests itself in darkness, evil deeds, and diminishing capabilities or diminishing ability or even injustice and many other things as well. And there's no way that you can be a servant without having the evidence showing forth of whose servant you are and who your master is. You will always show which master you serve because of you are handling and stewarding their storehouses and their goods. Only good comes from one storehouse and only evil comes from the other. In an earthly sense, if you serve a good master, it will show in your dress in your manner of dealing with others, in your manner of yourself as well, and how you, um, because of how you are dealt with, and so that's how you deal with others. If your master is rich, there will be richness seen in you and in your person, in your dress, in your, um, and if your master is poor, then there will be leanness seen in you. If your master is harsh, it will show in your manner to others as well, and your dress, and even on your own person itself, because there will be marks upon your own body for, from his harshness. So the quality of the master is seen in his servants. And I also wanted to focus on the word yield that is in the scripture. Um, there's much to be seen in it, and I won't go into all of it because there's not enough time and it's late already. Um, to yield yourself is to give yourself over to someone else or to something else. It's to surrender, to submit, to raise the white flag, to give up. There's no room for free will in this word. When you are yielded, there is no dictating being done by that servant. They are the masters and will do what their master desires. There is no other option. The servant is yielded, so the master is able to do what he desires to do. If the servant was free to do his will, then the master's will would not be fulfilled. That would be a bad thing for the master, for it's the master's desire to do good to both him and his servant, or in the sense of Satan, the good that they desire whatever that good may be. It may not be good to themselves, but whatever they're looking for gaining, that would be the good that they are desiring. And if the, desert, dis, and if the servant has decided to execute his will, then both would be disadvantaged. So I'll go ahead and read the text again, let Brother Michael come up and expound more of what is in this text. It's, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Good evening, brother. Good evening. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. <clears throat> As you know, uh, there are several questions that are asked in this chapter. Mm -hmm. And uh, as the, the brethren have already very ably pointed out, there's a reason behind these questions. These are given, these, this is, uh, in this particular chapter, they, these are written by the Apostle Paul, but of course he's speaking for God. So this is God asking you to, to ponder these questions that he asks. <clears throat> but now there's a, I want to kind of go back into Romans chapter 5, not, not really in depth, but just to prepare a context for these questions. <clears throat> in Romans chapter 5, it's covered how that we are justified by faith, justified in the blood of Jesus Christ, <clears throat> Christ 
died for us when we were yet sinners. And it, it goes into detail of how sin entered into the world through one man, Adam, and that the entire human race was cursed because Adam's our, our father. We're all, we're all men like Adam. So we, we inherited his sinful nature, but then sin was removed by the obedience of one, Jesus Christ. And we're, we're given the free gift of righteousness in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so chapter 5 deals with, uh, <clears throat> deals with sin being taken away and right away from these things. You can tell now we're, we're addressing believers now. This is written to believers. We get to chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, two questions are asked, <clears throat> or two of the questions that are asked. In verse 1, shall we continue in sin? that grace may abound. That's in view of chapter 5, in view of what God has done to yeah. save us, yeah. in view of who we used to be and where we were, even when we were in our mother's wombs. Yeah. Consider that. And God delivered us at great price Amen. in the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the background of where these questions are coming from. <clears throat> and then in chapter, uh, again, chapter 6, verse 15, he asks again, what then? Shall we sin? And the answer, the Apostle Paul gives answer to these questions, and the answer is actually another question. Don't you know? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Know ye not? And then the, the second question, shall we continue in, what then? Shall we sin because we are no longer under the law but under grace? Know ye not? There's another question here. This is something that we need to think about and consider. <clears throat> Believers ought to know. So this is a, you don't go down to the bar and, and shout in the door, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That, that's the wrong audience. They're, they're not experiencing the grace of God in there. That's the wrong audience. This is to believers now. And believers need to consider this matter of sin. That's what this is about. We still have to consider this matter of sin. <clears throat> Having been delivered from sin and called out of darkness into his marvelous light, <clears throat> we ought to be able to draw some conclusions about the sin that we were delivered from. Know ye not is also like saying, Brother Jonathan mentioned this, remember, remember the way that you were and where you were, Remember how you were delivered? Did you learn anything from this? This is written to people who have been made free in Christ and therefore are capable of choosing. The, the Holy Spirit wouldn't ask these questions if we weren't capable of choosing, if we were not made free. We don't ask belie unbelievers these questions because they're, they're not free. They don't have any choice to make. They're, they're uh, in bondage under sin. <clears throat> we are given a choice between two masters. And the Apostle Paul goes as far as to tell us what the results will be for each choice, for each master. <clears throat> if we choose sin, the end is death. If we choose obedience, that is to God, of course, the end is righteousness which is everlasting life. <clears throat> so this choice, this is not like coming to a fork in the road for the believer. This, no, see, we're on the way. There is no fork in the road. If you see another road, that's the wrong road. That's the wrong way. So that's the point that this question is, at, question is asked. You're in the right way. Christ put you here. Now about this side road. Know ye not? Side road. Is that the way you want to go? Remember? Remember these things? <clears throat> so if we're in Christ, we are in the way, and every other way is a distraction that leads to death. <clears throat> so the matter of choosing is about dealing with the old nature and temptations and desires of the carnal nature to return to sin. <clears throat> There are some key phrases here that Paul uses to indicate, again, I want to emphasize that he's writing to people in Christ. 
He says, shall we continue in sin? That can only be spoken to believers. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Being baptized into his death, walk in newness of life, in the likeness of his resurrection, that we should not serve sin. He that is dead is freed from sin. We are dead with Christ and live with him. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. Let not sin therefore reign, neither yield ye. See, these are all spoken to believers who have some kind of a choice in this matter. Unbelievers don't have a choice. <clears throat> They're not free. So the, in Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience, unto righteousness. <clears throat> now I noticed here Paul doesn't say that if you yield yourself unto the de to the devil it'll be unto death. <clears throat> but instead he's saying whether of sin. <clears throat> now ultimately if you yield yourself to sin you are yielding yourself to the devil. But that's not the way Paul says it. He says if you yield to sin. <clears throat> the way Paul speaks about this indicates that this is something that is close to us. <clears throat> he doesn't speak about sin as if it were some external phenomenon or a master who lives far away and comes around for a visit every now and then. <clears throat> knowing this, in Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin. It's, it's our old man. <clears throat> Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, it, it's true you are dead indeed unto sin, but you have to reckon on it. That's because it's sin still very close to you. Even though you're dead to it in Christ, it's still close to you. And then he says, continuing, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Paul is stressing here that sin was produced by us, and there's a possibility, if we yield to it, that it can be produced by us again. Sin came from us. And there is that part of us that we inherited from Adam that still has the desire to sin and the capacity to sin. Sin's not some ethereal concept that the apostles philosophized about. Sin is the product of the sinful nature which all men, except for Christ, have. <clears throat> now Paul speaks about it this way for at least two reasons. For one, it's true. That's just the way it is. <clears throat> This, this, is, this nature is still with us as long as we're in these mortal bodies. We have the sinful nature to contend with. But also, this is preparation for Romans chapter 7. So he's in, in preparation for Romans chapter 7. He doesn't speak about sin as if it's some, some concept that exists or it's something afar off. He speaks about it acknowledges that it's close to every one of us so that we, we understand what's going on when we feel that urge, when the, when the flesh uh, is tempted. <clears throat> and he says in Romans 7, verse 21, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. <clears throat> there is a law operating in the carnal nature which always results in sin which leads to death. The carnal nature is in you and it is in me and it is warring against us, against the new creature that God has made. It is calling out and fighting to regain dominance and bring us back into captivity to sin. This law is, and this capacity is in every one of us. That's why Paul warns about serving sin in Romans chapter 6. 
Sin is not a stranger that comes and knocks on the door of your house every now and then. The capacity to sin is not close to home, it is in the home. The capacity now I'm talking about. It comes from within you, and believers must know this and be aware of what is resident in the mortal body. The good news is that that part of us was crucified and is crucified with Christ. It was dethroned when we were buried with Christ in baptism, and the new man was put in charge when we were raised with Christ. That's what freedom is. <clears throat> it's the freedom to say no to temptation, the freedom to keep the old sinful nature on the cross. The sinful nature is not on the loose and running rampant in the believer. We are dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what the Apostle Paul is exhorting us to do here in Romans chapter 6 is to ensure that we keep it that way. <clears throat> and again, I want to bring this up. This can only be spoken to believers. Amen. Only believers have this freedom to make this choice. <clears throat> So Paul reasons about sin in Romans chapter 6. We've been justified and given the free gift of righteousness, yet the carnal nature is with us, so Paul exhorts us to crucify the flesh. <clears throat> uh <-huh. clears throat> and really, every believer has got to come to this point, and some perhaps brush it off or don't acknowledge it, but every believer, once you... A believer hears and believes the gospel, as such as we, we talked about Romans chapter 5, about justification from sin and justification in the blood of Christ and the free gift of righteousness. All this dealing with, at least on the, on the outset, it seems like it's all dealing with past sins, which it does. But sooner or later, you've got to think about what about now? What about present sin? What about temptation? What about the future. <clears throat> so we, the, that's what these warnings are for. <clears throat> Many have believed the gospel and were baptized into Christ and been, uh, they have faith that his blood cleanses them from past sin. They know they need to obey God and they want to obey God. They know they've been forgiven. They've been saved by grace, but they don't have the answers about the sinful nature that is still with us. The gospel does not end with, and Jesus died for our sins. That's at the beginning of it. <clears throat> Amen. The Apostle Paul now masterfully reasons with us concerning sin, and he expects us to be able to follow along and to understand. So he begins with this question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now you know there are many professing believers that have answered yes to that. <clears throat> One reason they can't answer the question properly is because they've not read the other questions in Romans chapter 6. They haven't heard the reasoning that the Holy Spirit gives, or they haven't heard all of the gospel, or they have not put a lot of thought into what Jesus has done. So the Apostle Paul tells us the answers to the questions about sin in Romans chapter 6. If you have questions about sin, believers have the answers. We have answers in Jesus Christ, good answers, and right answers, and satisfying answers. <clears throat> so most people don't, they don't think about service when they think about sin. They don't think about slavery and bondage. Yeah. They might think about right and wrong and causing offense and guilty feelings and forgiveness and punishment and these kinds of things, but few people when they consider sin do they think about masters <clears throat> and slavery and service and bondage? But those are the things that the Holy Spirit speaks about yeah. when he Amen. talks about sin. Yes. Yes. When believers consider sin, they should begin by knowing what sin is and where it comes from. They should know the entire process from beginning to end of how sin is produced as well as its effects. Sin is no small or insignificant matter. <clears throat> sin is never okay. Amen. Because of sin, the entire human race was condemned. Because of sin, the Lord destroyed the world with a flood, save for Noah and his family. And you could go through the entire scriptural record and see how God deals with sin. <clears throat> it's not okay. <clears throat> Amen. 
And finally, we'll have to remind one another that if Jesus comes and finds any of us in sin, it will mean eternity in the lake of fire. Of all the people on the face of the earth, believers ought to have the right answers about sin. Amen. There are two main concepts that I want to deal with in my main text. That is that men are servants by nature and that sin is the product of something. Specifically, sin is the product of service to Satan. <clears throat> and throughout Romans chapter 6, that's what Paul tells us, that sin is a product. Sin is the fruit of something. It's the result of something. Sin was not a part of God's creation. Everything that God made was good and perfect, and God was very pleased with it. Romans 5.12 tells us that by one man, sin entered into the world. Sin was an imposter that was brought into God's creation. And of all things, one of his, his highest creation on earth, a man, brought it in. <clears throat> sin was like a poison or an infection that was brought in and defiled everything that God had done. Sin always has this effect. Sin always makes things worse. And sin itself grows worse. Sin never gets better and it never makes anything better. Sin is a spoiler, a corrupter, and a ruiner of what God created. If sin is the fruit of something, then how was it produced in God's creation? How did it get here? How was man able to produce sin in God's world? <clears throat> Now, most believers know the answer to those questions. The simple answer is sin came through Adam. Adam and Eve sinned because they yielded themselves to the devil. <clears throat> mm -hmm. They rejected the word of God and received the word of a different master. Now, past sin is usually easier to deal with than present sin <clears throat> or the possibility of present sin. Past sins are forgiven and atoned for we know where they came from and what Jesus did to grant us forgiveness, but it seems considerably more difficult to answer questions about continuing in sin for some people. <clears throat> this, uh, my main text, Romans 6, 16, again, this is spoken to believers. That's why Paul says, to whom ye yield yourselves. Those who have been raised together with Christ have a choice of masters, but I should stress this is like a, this isn't a choice you make all the time, as we'll see. There's, there, this is kind of like a, a one-time choice. Christ has made you free. You may not always be free if you choose another master. <clears throat> we should be clear that no other men have this choice. But we also need to consider that if we make the wrong choice, it could be the last time we have freedom to make a choice. Adam could tell us. Once a free man yields himself to the devil, he may not be free any longer. No man is freed from bondage to the devil until Jesus makes him free. Amen. Paul's talking about sin, but at the same time, he's warning believers about going back to it. What every man produces is the product of whom we serve. Sin is the product of serving the devil, Obedience is the product of serving God. <clears throat> the following reasoning is, detailing, is dealing with getting rid of sin. Man is not free, but servants by nature. And there are only two masters. There's God and the devil. Yeah. And really the devil has a master too. He was created. Yeah. Shall we sin is the same thing as asking, shall we go back to our former master, back to bondage, right. back to darkness and death? Shall we serve sin or serve obedience? Shall we serve Satan or serve God? <clears throat> now, it's not that if men sin, they will end up serving the devil, but men sin because they are serving the devil. Right. Sin is the product of service to a particular master. <clears throat> Unbelieving people sin because they are already enslaved. It's not that there's a chance that you might become enslaved if you keep sinning. Sin is the fruit of service to the devil, and death is the product of sin. If you serve the devil, you will sin. If you serve God, 
you will be obedient. Satan is the wicked master, but he works through the carnal nature that we inherited from Adam. <clears throat> Satan and the carnal nature of man are like two magnets that are attracted to each other. The devil is only one half of the equation. Our carnal nature is the other half. Those who belong to him are in total slavery to sin. Jesus said you cannot serve two masters. He didn't say you're not supposed to serve two masters. That's like, that's like saying you're, you're not supposed to have two jobs or two employers. No, it's different. You cannot serve two masters. It's impossible because men are not free. They were not born free. It is impossible that we not have a master. It is impossible for mankind not to be servants. Man is not the highest creation. There are superior powers that exist, the greatest one of which is God, our creator, who made every power and authority, and who is over every power and authority, and who is the God and father of us all. Adam and Eve were created. <clears throat> that fact alone ought to indicate that they were not completely free, and that none of Adam's offspring are free. And what's this? Our, even before they had sinned, God had given them a commandment. Free people don't receive commandments. They, they, were, they were already in service to God. God created them. <clears throat> and another master convinced them to disobey that commandment. One of the very first things that Adam and Eve did was prove that they were not free. Once they had sinned, they and all their offspring became the servants of Satan. No offspring of Adam has been born free since. We are all born in service and bondage to a master. That is the wonder and the glory of salvation that Christ has freed us Amen. from this bondage. Freed us from the wicked one to serve God. Amen. We were born in slavery, but now we are free in Christ. Not, not free from service not free from any and all masters, but free from Satan and free from sin and free from the end of sin, which is death. <clears throat> now there is, uh, just as kind of a side note, another way to forfeit the freedom that's in Christ. <clears throat> There's other ways than just blatant sin. And there are epistles in the scriptures that address this. Some have forfeited freedom in Christ or are in danger of doing so because of returning to the law, such as the, the Galatians and the Colossians. They were deceived by false teachers. What they are in danger of losing was freedom from the law. They thought they were serving God by being circumcised and observing Jewish feast days and holy days. They did not blatantly rebel against God, but they had received a false gospel. This is a different issue from what is being addressed in Romans chapter 6, but it ends in the same result if it's not stopped. Mm -hmm. See, all these are the wiles of the devil. <clears throat> in Romans 6, the issue is blatant sin, fulfillment of carnal desires and carnal pursuits, continuing in sin just like we were living before Christ saved us, the issues in Galatians, Ephesians, and some other places is false doctrines that crept in among believers. In Corinth, it was pride and very bad behavior and lack of charity and false doctrine. James wrote to hypocrites. Jude wrote to people who were being distracted away from the gospel. However, the result of all these scenarios is sin. False teaching, false gospels, false Christ always lead to sin. If embraced and followed long enough, they will result in a change in masters, just like Paul tells us about in Romans 6. The intent of everything that is authored by Satan is this, to get believers to change their service from God to him. It's a lure to get believers back into his service and thus thwart the work of Christ. Service to a master produces <clears throat> a particular thing in the servant, and service to Satan is complete domination of the person. It causes the servant to produce what the master wants. 
It cannot be otherwise. Yielding is service. To whom we yield is whom we serve. And whom we serve is what determines the fruit we produce. When we yield to temptation or play with temptation, we are yielding to a master, to a far superior person. Temptation to sin is the luring of a master. It's like, it's like fishing with the lure. The fish sees something that he thinks he wants, but what the fish is seeing is not at all what he thinks it is. It's a lure, and behind the lure is a hook. It's the same thing with Satan. He, he will seek to deceive the people of God <clears throat> to lure them away, and once they're on the hook, they have a new master. <clears throat> The devil was a master long before you and I came along. <clears throat> he has mastered the entire human race, beginning with Adam. Every one of us were born in slavish, non-reversible service to him. The only ones who are free are those who Christ has made free. The only ones who can resist the devil are the ones who have been delivered by Christ. There are differences between an employee and a slave. Employees are paid for their skills and their time. Employees can quit their jobs, although that may not be wise at times. Employees can look for another employer. Employees can even sometimes bargain for their pay and benefits. Employees get vacation days and paid holidays and sick time off. None of these things apply to slaves. A slave's entire existence is for his master. Many people think that they are the employees of the devil as if he's going to pay them when in fact they are in slavish bondage to him. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there is no such thing. Satan has no employees. His slave's entire existence is to lend themselves to the devil's will. Through the carnal nature, he controls their works, their thoughts, their intentions, their motivations. He is master over them by means of the carnal nature. Adam's nature cannot say no to the devil. The only person the flesh consistently says no to is God. Freedom is such an important thing for the human race. <clears throat> Many people seem to think that serving God is enslavement when in fact they take no thought that they are already enslaved to the devil. <clears throat> Why don't they think that? Because they are slaves. Mm -hmm. Amen. Everything is either light or darkness or of the devil or of God. <clears throat> the person who has been made free in Christ is able to understand and detect both light and darkness, but those who dwell in darkness cannot. Those who are slaves of, of Satan cannot detect both these things. <clears throat> I, I apologize if this seems very kind of a depressing, this is, this is the reason that Paul is, is dealing with us in Romans 6 about returning to sin, about yielding yourselves. <clears throat> and it, it's going to get better if you'll bear with me. <laughs> They've been blinded and remain in bondage to darkness until the Lord frees them. So this service is not a matter of feeling obliged, but of complete domination over the mind and heart. Those who serve sin do not serve unwillingly. Likewise, those who serve God <clears throat> do not serve unwillingly. Mm -hmm. Serving sin is not like I don't really want to, but I feel obligated to. Kind of like the way people sometimes look at serving their employer. Often the will is not there, but the obligation is there. But in service to sin... The heart and mind is thoroughly involved in the slavery, in the service, in the bondage. And this is amply stated in Scripture. Romans 1.28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And Romans 8.5, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, Romans 8, 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. In Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, 
and Colossians 1.21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. And Titus 1.15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Unbelievers are not free in any sense. Service to sin is complete and total domination by it. Part and parcel with the bondage is a deception that you are free. Adam's race is completely enslaved, body, heart, soul, and mind. In Adam, our existence is vanity, sin, and death. However, in Christ, believers can say this, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. In Christ, we have been freed to serve the one who has forgiven us all sins and imputed righteousness to us and given us the gift of eternal life and inheritance in the world to come. We are free indeed. <clears throat> the idea that a, a believer can choose to sin for a while and then return to serving God is a myth. Amen. And this is what Paul is warning against Christ freed us, but if we choose to go back to sin, that freedom is forfeited. And regaining freedom is not up to you if you decide to go back. Once a free person has yielded himself to sin, he is no longer free. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Mm -hmm. And Hebrews 10, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more... There's no more God can do for you. Uh -huh. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Right. Considering the truth of what it cost to make us free, and taking into account the investment that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit made in freeing us from sin and keeping us free from it, and taking into account the foolishness of forfeiting the freedom that Christ has given us for the temporal pleasures of sin for a season, and acknowledging the truth that all men cannot help but be servants to one of two masters, either God or the devil, then every believer ought to be scared to death to sin. Amen. Every temptation ought to be offensive to us. Yes. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. This is when our change came. <clears throat> this is how our change came. Our change in status, that is from serving one master to serving another, this is completely wrapped up in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon there, that means to calculate by faith. Once illuminated, we know who our master is, our new master. We ought to know that we are dead with Christ and freed from sin, that we live with him and in him. Reckon that if our new master is God, then we are no longer servants to sin. We know that Jesus really did bear all our sins in his body on the tree. That is why God made him a curse that is why he died and went to the grave. Those things are real and true. Therefore, we must reckon that when we were buried with him, just as surely as he went down with our sins, we went down with our sins too. And just as surely as God was pleased with him and raised him from the dead and received him up into heaven to be seated at his right hand, God is surely pleased with us and has raised us up to sit with Christ in heavenly places. Just as surely as Jesus is serving God, the f Jesus is even serving, 
is serving God the Father by reigning over all things, we have been freed to serve him too. And God is a rewarder. <clears throat> because Jesus lives, we live. This seemed like a good place to me to say knowledge is power. Believers ought to know this stuff. It's right here in Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> so I exhort you to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Now that was written to the Galatians. Their bondage, or their approach to bondage, was to go back to the law. But any bondage is bondage. <clears throat> stand fast in the freedom and the liberty maintain it and yet from another point of view we were freed by the new covenant which is in Christ's blood for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people no longer do we have reprobate minds no longer do we mind the things of the flesh. No longer are we enemies in our minds by wicked works. No longer are our minds and consciences defiled. No longer are we in bondage to the devil, but God has put his laws in our minds and written them on our hearts. We have been made free and now serve a beneficent master, abundant in grace. And what is the end of our service to our great God? Righteousness, holiness, and in the end, everlasting life. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. God be thanked. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>